Boldwood presents The Split. Written by Amanda Brookfield and read by Candida Gubbins. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. For David Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. From Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare First Dates Chapter 1 by the time Esther reached the turn at the railway bridge into her road, she was quite alone. One of the fast trains shot past, a bomb burst in the silence, and she jumped like a ninny. The road was narrow and long, hugging the curve of the railway line. Her rented little terraced house was still a good walk away, down at the far end, part of a run-down row made affordable both by its distance from the convenience of the high street and by its proximity to the concrete flat blocks where washing fluttered like bunting in the boxy balconies and neon graffiti lit up the walls. Esther walked quickly, looking straight ahead, clasping her handbag tightly under her arm, fighting sinking spirits both at how insecure a 48-year-old woman could still feel mid-evening on a city street and how desperately far she remained from the newly single future she had dared to envisage for herself, leaving Lucas and moving, by a miserable couple of months with her parents, to London two years before. The July night air was muggy, her feet still spongy in her high heels, and her mane of hair long since collapsed out of the shape she had painstakingly created with her tongs, was gluey on the back of her neck. She wanted to take her jacket off, but feared the kerfuffle of stopping in the lamplit, dark, looking like the middle-aged woman on her own she was, vulnerable and faffing, easy prey for anyone seeking a target for their own disappointments. The jacket had been wrong anyway, tight like most of her wardrobe these days, as well as overly formal and trying too hard for a first date in what turned out to be a riotously crowded Riverside East Sheen pub. She had identified Chris Muse at once. Reassuringly similar to his profile credentials, tall and shaven-headed and looking the opposite way as he waited on the fringe of the melee of smokers and drinkers gathered round the pub entrance. Noting his smart, casual style of dress and relaxed demeanour, Esther had felt her jitters ease slightly. Crisp, dark blue jeans, loafers and a tan T-shirt, loose enough to curtain the gentle swell of stomach underneath. He looked like one of those men, appealingly and enviably easy in their own skin. His height meant he carried his extra weight well, Esther had decided. Double-checking her jacket was buttoned up across her own tummy bulges, before bracing herself for the camera click of first impressions as his head turned. Hello, Esther. Nice to meet you. His northern vowels sounded stronger than they had during their two phone conversations, which had covered all sorts of promising ground, from parenting challenging teenagers, to a mutual enjoyment of crime thrillers. Spotting her, he had stepped forward at once, his right hand outstretched, the piercing dark brown eyes, which had dominated the online picture, half disappearing among the crinkles of his smile. You too. His grip was warm and firm. Esther smiled back without having to try, glad of her mother's good teeth and Nordic blonde hair that hid the grey so well, and getting a flashback to the contrastingly awful, limp, clammy handshake of Jim, 
the widowed violinist two weeks before. A widower, a musician, ideal, Viv had cooed in the half-serious, half-joking way designed to boost the spirits of her oldest friend, while also reinforcing her frequently voiced professional opinion that no woman, least of all Esther, needed a partner to complete herself. This still new venture into online dating should just be about enjoying herself, she had counselled, slipping into full psychologist mode, about making the most of this period of freedom while Dylan was on the post-A-level visit to his father. Esther had dutifully agreed, managing not to say how easy that was for Viv to say, surrounded by steadfast Brian and their four vibrant, grounded children. She hadn't mentioned either just how hollow her rented little home always felt without her rangy, maddening 18-year-old bounding round it. Nor how visceral were the stabs of envy at the thought of Dylan loafing with Lucas in Cambridge instead, and having the luxury of Lily, his brainbox elder sister, just down the road, already throwing herself with typical Lily-like energy into life as a postgraduate. It's only a few weeks, Viv had added gently, detecting Esther's misgivings in her uncannily brilliant way. See it as a chance to really let your hair down, sweetheart, to start being all the things that husband of yours put a stopper on for twenty years. What things? Esther had wanted to ask, in danger these days of forgetting what it was she had lost touch with. What the hell she'd been trying to get back to when Lucas's behaviour finally tipped her into throwing in the towel after two decades. Appearances so did matter, Esther had decided, admiring the smooth globe of Chris's head as she followed him across the sticky floor of the pub to the cluster of dining tables at the far end of the bar, as did the basic, oh-so-telling courtesy of being truthful in dating profiles. The violinist Jim swung back to mind, along with a mesmerizingly botched and fragile comb-over that had momentarily stopped her in her tracks when he waved hello. In the profile photo, there had been a rather cherubic head of light gingery curls. Widower, she had reminded herself, her heart readying to soften nonetheless at the memory of the wife's lost battle with cancer referenced in his biog. But Jim's preferred subject had turned out to be himself. His musical credentials, all the famous concert venues he had graced with his presence in the second line of a row of violins. When Esther had ventured an allusion to her own modest musical abilities, he had told her how much harder the violin was to master than the piano. The mention of her teaching beginners had prompted a look of haughty pity. And yet, out in the street, after an interminable hour, he had appeared distraught and astonished when she'd diplomatically rejected the notion of a second meeting. But why? he had asked, flinging out his thin arms. You don't know me. Esther had shaken her head, gormless and guilty. Not to want to know a person, it felt like a crime. As she had watched him trudge away, the slender frame hunched in defeat, the comb-over raised like a flimsy sail. Relief had been accompanied by the unsettling aftertaste of her own cruelty. Life has hurt me too, she had wanted to call after him, just in different ways. I'm not really strong, only trying to be. Chris Muse, with his easy manner and big smile, was immediately so much more promising. By the time they were wedged into their little corner table and had placed their orders, he had teased all sorts of information out of her, including the fact of her imminent late July birthday the following Saturday. Maybe I could take you out to celebrate. He raised his pint of beer to chink against her wine glass. If things go well, of course, and you don't have other plans. He shot her a mischievous grin. 
I'm not till January, so we'll leave that one on the table. Maybe, Esther murmured, her hopes bouncing, even though she knew it was too soon. I mean, that would be nice, if things go well, as you say, no jumping the gun. No gun jumping allowed, he grinned, directing a finger pistol at his temple. Esther's stomach performed another lurch of anticipation. She had no birthday plans and was starting to dread the fact. Dylan would still be in Cambridge and Lily was about to head off backpacking with Matteo, her boyfriend since their days of hand-holding in a school lunch queue. It wasn't fair to expect Viv and Brian to fill the blanks in her diary, just because Richmond was a stone's throw from Kingston nor her parents, for that matter, who lived in Amersham, an hour down the motorway. Proximity to both had been a key factor in Esther's decision to settle in West London, but such dependence, almost two years on, was starting to feel like failure. In desperation, she had that morning emailed Shona, a long silent friend from uni days, suggesting they fix something up, not just with her birthday in mind, but in the hope of rekindling the friendship generally. Sorry, Chris announced suddenly. I need the little boy's room. Would you excuse me? Of course. Little boy's room. Well, you couldn't judge someone on one piece of terminology, Esther scolded herself, seizing the chance to sneak a check on her face in her handbag mirror. No specks between her teeth yet. No smudges on her nose. Hair good. The lack of a social life was why she was here, she reminded herself firmly, scrolling her phone, but finding nothing new except a couple of work emails. Esther steepled her fingers, trying to look composed, instead of like a woman wondering when her blind date would emerge from the toilets. As more minutes passed, she fiddled again with her phone and then pretended to read a junk mail envelope in the bottom of her bag, while continuing to brood on the embarrassing narrowness of her social circle. The falling away of Cambridge friendships had been something she was prepared for. That it had always been so much more Lucas's world than hers had been a consistent thread in their tapestry of difficulties, but the continuing challenge to fill the void remained an unwelcome surprise. It was because she worked mostly from her laptop, Esther brooded, and because Dylan's vast, impersonal West London Sixth Form College meant barely encountering a teacher, let alone other parents. Her five little piano students were dropped off and scooped up like parcels, while her neighbours were exactly what she remembered from her early post-uni days in London, exchanging nods and names but bent mostly on keeping to themselves. The pair on her left, Dimitri and Sue, both worked nights. He as a taxi driver and she in a care home. And Carmela, the old lady on the other side, emerged only to issue squeaky summonses for the large tabby that used Esther's overgrown back garden as its toilet and hunting ground. Sorry, got caught on a call, Chris explained looking a little flustered, and arriving back at the table at the same time as their food. Hey, I'm going to need your help with these, he joked, indicating the mountain of chips smothering the ribeye and a few squirrels of salad. No, I'm fine. Go on, you know you want to, he laughed, turning the plate round so the fries were within easier reach. Thanks. Esther took two dipping them into the dressing that had come with her chicken salad, but which she had asked to have on the side, because everyone knew that was where the calories lurked. He watched the dunking in amusement. We could ask for ketchup. Or here, have some of my French mustard. No, this is fine, fabulous. The chips were very good, and Esther began to relax. She took two more and then another relishing suddenly the simple, almost forgotten pleasure of being out in the company of a warm, presentable man. Yes, she told Viv inside her head. She was an independent woman who knew her own mind, blah, blah. But 
There was being single and being lonely, and boy had she learnt the difference, especially when Dylan wasn't around. An exception that would soon be the norm. Esther felt the usual flutter of selfish panic. A-level results were almost a month away. Then it would be university. Then he'd be half lost to her, like Lily. All right. She blinked, Chris's crinkly smiling features back into focus. Very all right, thanks, Chris. I'm going to get another one of these. The first slipped down so well. He tapped his glass, waving at a waiter. Are you okay with your wine? Would you like another? Or maybe a cocktail? Oh no, I'm fine for now, thanks. This is delicious. Esther sipped her Sauvignon Blanc to prove the point. Aware of her cheeks, starting to do the pulsing thing that meant she was too hot, she peeled off her jacket, draping it over her chair, and shuffled closer into the table so as to be sure of keeping her stomach out of sight. Having settled herself, she sensed Chris had been watching her intently. I am seriously tempted to jump that bloody gun, Esther, he murmured, just so you know. Are you? Well, that's nice. To be so rusty at flirting, it was pitiful and also weird, like feeling seventeen and seventy simultaneously. Leos and Capricorns are a match made in heaven, by the way, is common knowledge. July and January, they go hand in glove. A perfect fit. Esther couldn't help laughing. Well, that sounds fortunate, though I'm afraid I'm not exactly an expert on astrology. Nor me! He let out a roar of a laugh, tipping his head back and displaying flashes of old-fashioned fillings reassuringly like hers. He was fifty-two, she remembered, like Lucas. But so not like Lucas, another species. It's all nonsense, he went on, but that's what it's feeling like, right? Between us, now, you and me, Esther, the stars aligned. It's certainly feeling... Blimey, you must get tired of hearing it, but you are bloody gorgeous. Your hair, those blue eyes. Seriously, Esther, seriously. He reached for his pint, keeping his eyes fixed on her over the rim as he swigged. Oh, thanks, I... My mother is half Swedish, Esther faltered, both because compliments were impossible to respond to without sounding like an idiot and because she was starting to get the unsettling sensation of having boarded a runaway train. I'm not mad about wine, to be honest. I much prefer this stuff they make from hops. He tapped his glass. Are you okay with that? You won't tell me off? Tell you off for liking beer. Why would I ever do that? In fact, Esther was going to mention some of the wine snobs she'd met around Cambridge dining tables, but Chris appeared to have hit a groove. Because being told off, Jesus, have I had enough of that, I can tell you. The gleam of charm in his eyes darkened for a moment. But what I want to hear, he urged, making a visible effort to compose himself, is more about you. The stuff you write that you mentioned on the phone, for those business magazines, for instance. How you keep the wolf from the door. Tell me more. I want to know everything about you. He grinned mischievously. He proceeded to listen with a touching show of intense interest while Esther tried to inject as much sparkle as she could into the music degree that had somehow led, via menial editorial jobs, to a patchy career as a writer of business copy and provider of private piano lessons. Lucky students, having such a hot teacher is all I can say. Esther laughed uncertainly. Thanks, but to be honest, Chris, which I think is important. He glanced up quickly, a forkful of food poised in front of his mouth. Oh, blimey, yes. Bang on, Esther. Honesty every time, in everything. Good, because... Esther paused, shooing Lucas from her mind. Because actually, 
My students are far too young to think along such lines. Only two of them are boys, anyway. Billy and Craig, nine and thirteen, respectively. Ha, <laughs> well, Billy and Craig will have you in their fantasies, that's for sure. He took a hearty swig of beer that left two dots of froth at the corners of his mouth. Boys start very young. Trust me, Esther, I speak from experience. He swiped the froth away, his eyes holding hers again in their intense way. Mind you, with that teenage son of yours, you presumably know a bit about... Oh, yes, I know a bit about boys. Esther cut in quickly, not wanting the conversation to go anywhere near the ups and downs of Dylan's teenage years. And feeling a surge of protection for dear Billy, too. With his pink, translucent jug ears and tumbling, stubby, hopeless piano fingers. Chris was just trying to inject some sparkle into her own life for her, she told herself, wishing it were down an avenue she could more readily enjoy. So tell me a little more about your work, she encountered, proceeding to return the compliment of looking riveted while he described falling into IT via a failed start-up and now being within reach of a top management post. Strategic thinking rather than doing. That's the dream in my book, Esther. Actually, I love my job, he blurted with sudden bitterness, starting an assault on the remains of his steak as if it were an animal still requiring slaughter. It's having to give away most of my earnings to a heartless bitch that I'm not so keen on. That was her on the phone before. Why it took so long. Sylvie, Esther prompted feebly, recalling the name from the brief sharing of relationship histories during the phone call that had preceded the agreement to meet. Oh, splitting up is awful, isn't it? She ventured, truly wanting to offer comfort, but wishing the dreadful sawing of the ragged slab of meat on his plate would stop. However it gets dressed up, she faltered. Lucas's fury at having to sell their end of terraced Cambridge house coming back to her. The rants about stepping off the property ladder, the loss of guaranteed future worth. He had spat the words, more distressed it had seemed to Esther, at the loss of this financial potential than at the decimation of their love and their marriage. At least you have your lovely daughter, Kelly, wasn't it? Fifteen going on thirty-five, I think you said. Chris dropped his steak knife with a clatter that made her jump. I don't have Kelly, he growled. In fact, I have no access. He swigged angrily from his beer glass, slamming it down on the table. I was with lawyers today. That bitch of a mother has poisoned her against me. Esther flinched as a catalogue of grievances began to spew out. Sylvie had fleeced him and frittered away what she took. She had slagged him off, not just to their daughter, but to every friend and member of their respective families. One unscheduled ring of the doorbell now of what had once been his home, and it was called to the police and having the locks changed. Esther, chewing her bits of chicken and rocket leaves, far more than they required, was aware of shrinking into herself. Here was a different more extreme sort of emotional calamity than hers, and she wanted no part of it. Not because she was mean-spirited, but because it demanded an energy of which he simply did not feel capable. First world problems, maybe, but it was all she could do to carry her own current load. People, no matter what they looked like, weren't what she wanted them to be. That was the lesson. Behind the scenes, everyone including her, was messed up, damaged and full of potholes. It was all a complete minefield and she just wanted to go home. I've been going on. Forgive me, Esther, he groaned suddenly, parking his elbows on either side of his plate and dropping his head into his hands. It's OK, but actually... Something inside her had quietly snapped. The hubbub around them was deafening, the air so hot and thick it was hard to breathe. I have to be getting back. Now? But you haven't finished. What about another drink? 
He gestured helplessly at the salad remnants on her plate and the half-full wine glass. I have to get back because my son, Dylan, you mean? Esther found suddenly that she did not like hearing Dylan's name fall from his stranger's lips. Chris didn't know Dylan, or her, or anything about her misfiring life, and she didn't want him to. In fact, in that instant, she would have taken back every single sorry personal detail she had divulged if she could. From the little potted history in their first phone conversation about her and Lucas, falling in love and out again, to the existence of little Billy and Craig. Yes, I... Dylan and I... We have an early start tomorrow. But I thought you said he was in Cambridge with his dad. Yes, I did say that, because he is. Esther folded her napkin into a messy square and straightened her cutlery over her uneaten food. But tomorrow, we're heading off to check out one of the universities he's applied to. The University of the West of England. The one that's Bristol, but not Bristol, she blagged. Deciding untruthfulness with strangers maybe didn't matter quite so much after all. Especially when it was only a half-lie anyway, since they had visited UWE, and the nice people there had offered Dylan some very reasonable grades. I should have mentioned that I can't be late, she added lamely, forcing her hot arms back into the jacket and placing two precious twenty-pound notes on the table. But please do stay and finish your drink. She stood up so abruptly, she barged the person behind with her chair and had to apologise. No, 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 no. Chris was on his feet, plucking notes out of a wad, with a silver clip that he had pulled from his back pocket. I'm coming too. He paused to drain his glass, firing a what are you looking at glare at one of their many close neighbours ogling the scene. I shall see you safely back to Kingston, he declared grandly, partly for their audience, it seemed, to Esther. There really is no need, thanks, she murmured, setting off back through the bustle round the bar regretting even that he knew the area in which she lived. Come on, it's the least I can do, he called, loping after her. Outside, Esther kept up her stride in the direction of the station, cursing the state of penury that meant there was no question of escaping into a cab. Not that there were any in sight. Chris jogged until he was parallel. Please, Esther, this is no way to end the evening. I talk too much about myself, I know. Surely that... Sorry, Chris, but I'm just going to head home and would prefer to walk alone, if you don't mind. Thank you. Esther's voice sounded firm and icy even to her. Well, let me call you an Uber then. No, thanks. I'll take the train. OK, he said, one all of a sudden and letting her walk on. Goodbye then. Bye, she fired back, not looking round as she went even faster, nose in the air, and fighting the now familiar sensation of behaving like a total cow. The hopeless mishmash of humans trying to find soulmates struck her with a sudden depressing force. It was always the wrong people wanting the wrong people, looking for a magic she herself had once believed in but now knew didn't exist. On the train, she had composed a text, pressing send the moment she got a signal. Chris, thank you for the evening. Sorry to have ended it so abruptly. I have realised I'm just not in the right mindset for dating at the moment. I wish you all the best, Esther. The street lamp nearest her house was doing its usual on-off flicker creating an air of menace rather than security. Esther glanced furtively around as she crossed the road. Her throat was swollen with a dumb urge to cry. She had lied to Chris. She didn't prefer to walk alone. She preferred to walk with someone. For one unguarded moment, Lucas shimmered as something to miss rather than resent. They had begun so well thanks to chance, rather than dating algorithms. 
At her front door, Esther swayed. Her fingers were numb round her keys because of gripping them so hard, supposedly in readiness to ward off an assailant. A good stab at the eyeballs was the advice. Yeah, right, like she would ever manage that. She'd go quiet with terror, more like, become one of those victims who had juries shaking their heads. The key was gritty in the lock and hard to turn. One of the trillion things in the house that didn't work smoothly. Annoying, but too trivial to make a fuss about. The lock turned at last and the door gave way. In the same instant, a muffled thud from the street made Esther swing round, her heart pounding. But it was only Chico, her neighbour's tank of a tabby, jumping onto the bonnet of a car from where it crouched, watching her, its yellow eyes, lasers in the dark. Chapter Two Esther leant up against one of the book stacks at the rear of the shop for a breather, keeping an eye on the proceedings through a gap in the shelf. Her heels were high and her lower back stiff from charging around in them all day. Professor Tobin, whose catchily titled tome, Philosophy Maketh Man, was the reason for the event, was still in full flow to the fifty or so attendees. In his late sixties, with a long straggly beard that Esther wondered his wife didn't chop off with some garden shears, the professor was attired in a mustard-coloured corduroy suit and a gold bow tie, which, like his half-moon spectacles, glinted under the ceiling lights of the bookshop. He twirled the stem of his wine glass as he talked, one of the batch Esther had been mandated to collect, along with drinks and snacks from a nearby off-licence that afternoon. Just behind his left shoulder, leading the audience with head nods of appreciation and glass raising, was Stephen Goddard, Esther's lover as well as her boss, and senior editor in the academic wing of the small London publishing house that had employed her for over a year as its Girl Friday. Charismatic and flatteringly besotted, Stephen also happened to be married, but only until the right moment to extricate himself arrived, as he had spent the last nine months earnestly and repeatedly reassuring her. A literary event out of London would provide a rare and perfect pretext for them to be together properly for an entire night, he had pointed out excitedly when appointing her to help with the organising. A real treat after all the sporadic, snatched hours at her place, grabbed at if her flatmates were out and his wife was working late. Stephen had booked a hotel in celebration and had been making excited eyes at her through the glass walls of his office all week. A spy in the camp, came a whisper from the end of the book stack. Oh, no, Esther jerked round. I just... The tall, lithe young man who had issued the challenge and whom Esther had seen hanging around earlier on, pressed a finger to his grinning mouth by way of a reminder that it wouldn't do to divert attention from the proceedings beyond their hidden corner. Have no fear, your secret is safe with me. He spoke under his breath, mouthing the words with comedic exaggeration. Is it a good view? Stepping closer... He peered over the top of Esther's head, allowing her to note the faint stain on the green jumper underneath his shapeless suit jacket. She noticed, too, the density of his dark, unruly hair and how the jumper accentuated the extraordinary flecks of luminous green in his eyes. The eyes had escaped her notice before. She had been too busy rushing around helping arrange books and drinks and finding a pen for Stephen who had wanted to lend one to the professor and had forgotten his. All she had observed of this particular guest was that he didn't obviously fit the same mould as the others, being scruffier and younger, and appearing always to hover on the edge of each little conversational group, almost as if he shared her own sense of uncertainty and social unease for not being at the heart of things. Me, Lucas, 
he whispered, Mock punching his chest. You? Esther, she mouthed. Star. What? She bent her head nearer, thinking she had misheard. Your name, it means star. Nice dress, by the way. He stuck both thumbs in the air, and Esther found herself giggling. Are you an editor? He mouthed next, miming opening a book and a scowling appraisal of its contents. Esther shook her head, putting her hand over her mouth to stifle more laughter. She performed a return charade of shrugging her shoulders, as in, who knew what the hell she was, and then an add-on demonstration of singing and playing the piano. A musician! He feigned clapping, while Esther wagged her finger to indicate that this was a gross exaggeration of her status. Stephen's appearance round the end of the shelving unit, proof that in the absence of their attention the speeches had ended, caught them both by surprise. Esther, there you are. He glanced between their faces, his smile taut. You are needed. I'm coming, sorry, I was just looking after me. Her new acquaintance interjected easily, reaching to shake Stephen's hand. Dr. Lucas Shaw, new in town, part-time lecturer in medieval English, very much not a philosopher, but hoovering up everything I can. Brilliant talk, brilliant event. I do apologise for keeping Esther from her duties. He threw them a quick smile and strolled off. Do you know him? Stephen asked with studied casualness as they headed back into the fray. No, he just introduced himself. Esther tweaked the creases in her dress, which was sky blue and close fitting, and had left an indefensible hole in her meagre finances. She was the thinnest she had ever been, from the conflicting excitement and stress of loving Stephen, and rather hoping that the extravagance of the dress purchase might bolster her resolve to stay that way, as well as giving pleasure to the man who she believed would one day be her husband. It will soon be just you and me, Stephen murmured, the back of his hand brushing hers as they made their way across the shop, giving Esther one of the electric shivers that reminded her why they were where they were. Love. It took sacrifice and pain, patience. It certainly bore no resemblance to the two six-month relationships that had featured and fizzled out during her time at Exeter. Kevin and Ian, bass guitarist and football nut, respectively. They seemed inept, unsophisticated toddlers in comparison with Stephen. This was the real thing. I rung the hotel and asked for champagne. Stephen whispered, to be ready for when we arrive. And one day it will always be that way, Esther. Okay? For one long, heart-tugging instant, his deep-set blue eyes, handsomely offset by his wavy fair hair, found and held hers. Before he asked if she could top up glasses and dived back into the throng. It was three days later that a postcard, sealed in an envelope, arrived in the communal post box of the dingy Shepherd's Bush basement flat Esther shared with Shona and two girls who had advertised in The Lady about having a couple of spare rooms. Snatching the envelope out of the pile of bills and junk mail, Esther had somehow known at once to whom the exuberant handwriting belonged. Dear Esther, I have taken liberties and elicited your address from your employers through underhand means. This is because I would like the opportunity to take you out to dinner. Cambridge is not so far from London, and the train service, I have checked, is good. Name your day, except Thursdays, when I have to deliver a latish lecture, and preferred time, and I shall be there. Or phone, if you want to say no and need persuading. I have put my college number and extension at the top of this note. Until soon, I sincerely hope, Lucas.
The image on the other side of the postcard was of a knight on bended knee before an imperious-looking princess, the tresses of her golden hair and long blue gown flowing. The knight's head was raised, his eyes fixed on the princess's face as he pressed her small white hand to his lips. It took Esther a few moments to notice the tiny speech bubble etched on the dark background in Barrow beside the knight's mouth and containing a single word, spellbound. She had put the card into her bedside table drawer and then taken it out again to use as a bookmark later that night for the thriller she was reading, a twisting tale of revenge and murder set on a trawler in the Norwegian fjords. A global bestseller featuring a yearning relationship between the married captain and his secret lover, the book had been a gift from Stephen that Esther had been consuming avidly, thrills of recognition flaring at every mention of the captain's forbidden passion. That night, however, her thoughts kept drifting to her new bookmark, to the sort of man who would choose to devote his life to the study of things like knights and damsels and courtly love, and to the word spellbound. I'm with someone, she blurted out to Lucas three weeks later, persuaded to meet in a small Italian place near her flat. After two more postcards and a phone call to the Cambridge number, originally undertaken with the intention of achieving the opposite outcome. The new cards had been themed similarly to the first, both arriving in envelopes on consecutive Fridays, one depicting a knight trying to pull an arrow from his heart with a speech bubble saying, Ah! The other emblazoned with the words, Nothing is sweeter than love apparently said by some medieval cleric called Thomas a Kempis. We have been together almost a year now, and it really is serious, she went on solemnly, having seen no option but to explain the Stephen situation fully. I'm sorry, but just meeting you tonight feels a bit wrong, which I hope you can understand, because... Esther dried up in a fresh confusion about having agreed to the date, instead of sticking to her guns on the phone. And because ever since, picking her up from her doorstep, Lucas, for all the implications in his correspondence, had been notably amiable rather than ardent. It had even occurred to her that this second encounter, with the reality of her, as opposed to some overblown memory of a brief conversation behind some bookshelves, had caused his feelings to retreat. Friendship with another person can't be wrong, surely, he replied coolly, twirling spaghetti round his fork before raising it to his mouth. Or does Stephen not allow that? The fork disappeared cleanly between his even teeth, and he chewed slowly, watching her with fixed, inscrutable eyes. No, of course not. I mean... Stephen and I both have lots of friends, Esther floundered, thinking of Shona and Viv, her best friend since kindergarten, whom she saw rarely now because of her still being at a Scottish university studying to be a psychologist. She and Stephen would make their own friends, their own life together, just as soon as they could. It was something they talked about often. Trying to imagine her companion as part of that mix was hard, even if he was clearly regretting the grand gesture of catching a train to London to take her out for dinner. The spellbinding thing had definitely worn off. Which was good, Esther told herself, aware even so of a small, absurd, utterly unjustifiable flutter of disappointment. Despite that, she started to feel somewhat off the hook and, when Lucas started asking questions about her life, began to talk more freely. About the blow, while studying at Exeter, of facing up to not being good enough to pursue a career in music, as a pianist or anything else. About her hopes that the mundane role at the publishers might prove a stepping stone to better things. 
about longing for Stephen to get a move on with the ordeal of speaking to his wife. It seems to me that being in our twenties is all about seeking that elusive balance between ambition and happiness, Lucas offered kindly when she had finished, and to my mind, in the end, what one is should always matter far more than what one does, or who one is with, for that matter. Oh yes, that's so true. They were interrupted by the arrival of the bowl of mango and chocolate ice cream they had elected to share for dessert. The waiter set it down with a flourish between them, together with two long spoons. Esther picked hers up, and then hesitated, not wanting to be the first to start. I felt totally lost for most of my first three years at Manchester, Lucas confessed cheerfully, plunging his own spoon into the dessert with no sign of the same compunction. Between lectures, I spent a lot of time hanging out and drinking myself stupid with people I didn't like much. No girlfriend? Esther asked breezily, keeping her own focus now on tackling the mounds of ice cream, which was delicious and melting fast. Not really. Recently there was someone called Caroline, but she didn't think much of me heading south. He pulled a face. All I'm attached to these days is my passion for early English texts. He laughed easily, sitting back. A passion that began when I bumped into Sir Gawain and his Green Knight a good while ago now. But one thing led to another, as things do. It was an observation that was to echo at the back of Esther's mind several hours later, as they lay, still fully clothed, but breathing hard, side by side on her bed, their mouths raw from kissing, and her head spinning with a combination of remorse and arousal. She had dropped her guard. That was the trouble feeling sufficiently chatty and well-disposed after the meal to invite him back to hers for a quick coffee before his train. That she had made her position clear had been her logic and, as Lucas himself had so deftly pointed out, there was no crime whatsoever in making a new friend. When they were tucked into opposite ends of the flat's big, sagging sofa a little later, blowing the steam off their respective mugs of coffee, Esther had found herself sufficiently at ease to volunteer several personal details, including the annoying nature of Rick, her younger, sporty charmer of a brother, and their parents, at least their mother's, most favoured child, and the mind-numbingly blinkered middle-class existence of her parents, fussing between bridge evenings and rounds at the local golf club. The stultifying suburban dullness of my upbringing is actually the biggest embarrassment of my life, she announced gleefully, expecting him to laugh. But Lucas's eyes dropped to his coffee. I would trade my childhood for dullness any day, suburban or otherwise. Really? Oh, I see. I I mean, I'm sorry. Esther held her breath feeling glib and inadequate, torn between wanting him to go on and knowing she had no right to want any such thing. No siblings. He set the mug down on the little table by the sofa and leant back, folding his arms across his slim chest to belt himself in, it looked like. A father who prefers whiskey to milk on his cornflakes, despite the fact that the preference cost him his career, He stared straight ahead, puffing his cheeks and blowing air out of his mouth, as if continuing to speak required physical effort. A mother who looks the other way. The three of us tucked into a cottage in the wilds of Shropshire. It wasn't what you would call a recipe for fun. No, it doesn't sound it. I am so sorry. No need to be. It is done with. I left and never look or go back at least only very occasionally, because of my mother. She could leave, she could, but she never will, he said bitterly, unlacing his arms and giving them a shake. Your father, Esther ventured, so 
What did he do, if you don't mind my asking? Lucas snorted. Good question. No, I don't mind, but only because it is you doing the asking and I brought the subject up. Rare for me, I can assure you. The reason I did so was because I wanted... He scowled. I wanted it known by you. He blinked as he looked at her, his expression for a moment so guarded, so boyish, that Esther had a sudden, vivid glimpse of the timid, bright-eyed child he must once have been. My dear father is, was, a doctor, a GP, trusted by the local community. His voice was sharp with scorn. That thing about not being able to choose your families? It's so true. But it doesn't mean you have to hang out with them, right? He swivelled so that he was facing her properly, a sheepish grin suffusing his face like light. Sob story done with, OK? OK, Esther murmured, still embarrassed at the pettiness of her own complaints, but touched at having been confided in. She found herself marvelling, too, that, for all the obviousness of the good looks of the man sitting beside her, she had been dead right about the underlying uncertainty in his demeanour. A smart talker, for sure, but with a kernel of shyness inside. It was endearing. It also made it tricky to know how to be, how to react. I really like you, he blurted, plucking suddenly with badly chewed nails she hadn't noticed before, at a thread in the upholstery along the back of the sofa. He crossed one long leg over the other and then swung it awkwardly back to the ground. The thread grew and he snapped it off. In fact, it is probably only fair to tell you, Esther. He seemed to hover on her name, rolling the word softly around his mouth, that I have found it hard to stop thinking about you for... Let me see now. He made a big show of tugging up the sleeve of the starchy, new-looking, dark blue shirt, worn possibly even purchased in her honour, Esther realised, to consult the cheap, clunky, chain-linked watch on his wrist. Four weeks, one day, three hours and twenty-one minutes. Hence the postcards. Hence the postcards she echoed stupidly, adding, before she could stop herself, though I have been wondering if you'd changed your mind. Really? What a reckless and erroneous thing to wonder. A lilt had crept into his voice, a merriment. He had got his legs sorted and was edging closer. I am with someone, remember? Esther groaned, and not wanting to betray them. I'm not like that, you see, Lucas. I am loyal. I am... He had stopped his edging and was staring at her, frowning in puzzlement. Loyalty? To this Stephen Goddard? But surely you can see that the man betrays you every day with his wife. The clang of the gate at the top of the wrought iron stairs outside made them both start. Loud footsteps followed. Shona's, Esther guessed, from the familiar clack of heavy heels on metal. Quick, she whispered, leaping to her feet and beckoning Lucas to come with her, an impulse based purely on the impossible notion of having to switch to awkward introductions and small talk. By the time the front door thudded shut, Esther and Lucas had parked themselves on Esther's narrow bed, there being nowhere else to sit, and were propped side by side against the pillows and headboard like an old married couple. Along the passageway came the sound of the toilet flush, running taps, a loud thump and voluble cursing before the slam of another door. Now, where were we? Lucas picked up Esther's hand and turned it over, examining the palm. Nowhere, Esther said faintly. Lucas traced the tip of his index finger along all the fortune teller lines so lightly that it tickled. The map of you, 
he said softly. And I think it shows many things, including a great capacity for love. Esther had been half holding her breath when he used the hand to pull her nearer, closing his eyes in preparation to kiss. She saw his eyelids flutter, the intensity of the intent, before she closed her own. Ditch him, Lucas said later, when the kissing was done with and they were saying goodbye on the pavement. Esther, having led the tiptoeing navigation through the flat and up the stairwell. Not necessarily to be with me, he spoke gravely, keeping his distance now, standing so far away that Esther found it almost upsetting. Their clothes had remained in place, but just five minutes before they had been entwined, tasting each other, holding each other, Lucas displaying a tenderness that had felt at once tentative and alluringly assured. But because, in my twenty-seven years of experience, he went on grimly, learnt in part, I'm sorry to say at my dear father's knee, married men are often happy to take lovers. It is the enthusiasm for owning up to the deceit which they are less good at, not to mention keeping promises to leave their wives. Walk away from Stephen, Esther. There was pleading in his tone now. Not for anyone else, but for you. We each have a duty to guard our own backs in this world. Trust me, no one else can do it so well. Not even a smitten mug who would like the chance to make you fall for him instead. Many Happy Returns Chapter 3 Just checking whether Dylan crashed at yours last night. Why would he do that when he's with you, Lucas, in Cambridge? Esther had sat up so quickly the room was spinning. The clumsy lunge for her mobile had knocked over her bedside glass of water, and for a moment she was too sleep-befuddled to think what to do about it. That it was her birthday, that the caller might be Lily or Viv, had been the only half-lucid thoughts to enter her head, even as she registered that it was in fact her ex-husband's face on the screen. Why would he be with me? She repeated stupidly, already swinging her legs out of bed, tugging her nightshirt down, rubbing the sleep from the corners of her eyes and writing the glass. The water was pooling round Viv's birthday gift, a leather-bound journal emblazoned with the unnerving command, Write Your Life which had arrived the day before in an Amazon box Esther had opened without thinking. Inside, there had been a card containing apologies for not being able to drop by because of the kerfuffle of cramming in consultations and trying to get the family off on holiday to France that weekend. Because there was a party, Lucas said levelly. In London, an 18th. He's got keys. It's obvious he'll have decided to stay at yours. You know what he's like, last-minute merchant. Yes, thank you, Lucas. I do know what my own son is like, and no, it is not remotely obvious Dylan is upstairs. Esther was trying to be cool, but could hear the catch of panic in her voice. Anger, too, was stirring. The arrogance of Lucas, the insult of always being told things rather than listened to, Two years apart and a decree absolute had changed nothing. I would have heard him. She snatched the journal from the flood as she talked, throwing it onto the bed, aware of a fleeting, guilty certainty that she would never meet the book's challenge anyway. Viv always meant well and was big on the therapeutic importance of writing things down. In the early days after the split, when Esther had been stuck in the miserable, unnerving time warp of camping with Dylan at her parents. Her old friend had got her scrawling her darkest invectives on pieces of paper, stamping them underfoot and then ripping the whole lot to shreds. How could it help? Esther had wailed, only to find a surprising release in the sheer expenditure of energy, not to mention the faint notion of stamping on Lucas himself, 
and his catalogue of marital crimes. Whose party, anyway? Do you even know? It was satisfying to see him flinch. He never owned up to his feelings. He never owned up to anything. Esther yanked open her bedroom door as she talked, straining her ears for sounds upstairs. Motherly anxiety was jetting through her bloodstream now, and she wanted Lucas to share it, to admit it. But hey, let's look on the bright side and hope it doesn't involve ambulances this time, shall we? Don't be dramatic, Esther, that was years ago. Three years, Lucas. Three measly years. Esther strode out onto the landing as she talked, managing in the process to catch her little toe on the doorframe, which caused a stab of pain so blinding that she half collapsed onto the floor, clasping her foot and dropping the phone. What on earth are you doing? I am going up to Dylan's room, Lucas, she hissed, picking up the mobile, teeth clenched against the afterwaves of pain. What else would I be doing? She gave the screen a glare as she hobbled on towards the steep little staircase leading up to her tiny top floor. Behind Lucas's head, she could see the geometrically neat bookshelves of his treasured medieval texts, bright in the shafts of light falling through the tall windows of his Cambridge rooms. He looked spruce from his shower and morning stroll to college. Before that, Esther had no doubt, he would have done his usual dawn jog along the cam, as yet oblivious to the emptiness of the smaller of his airy flat's two spare bedrooms, the larger allocated for Lily, who, living now with Matteo, barely used it. Lucas liked to lay it on thick about having their 22-year-old daughter still studying at a college across town under his care, just as Dylan, for two years now, had been primarily under Esther's. But as they both knew... Lily was a breeze compared to her younger brother, always more independent and so brimming with drive and self-sufficiency that it could hurt. Panic over, Esper gasped, as much from relief as from the discomfort of managing the stairs with her injury. Look. She held the phone up so Lucas could share her view of the roughly torn piece of paper fixed to Dylan's bedroom door with a blob of chewed gum. Hey, Mum, surprise! Phone dead. Didn't want to wake you. Happy birthday. D. Two kisses. I knew it, Lucas crowed. Esther was too thankful to mind his smugness. She raised a finger to command silence instead and gently opened the door a crack needing badly to see Dylan with her own eyes. Her heart settled still further at the sight of a foot poking out from under the mountain of the duvet, so Neanderthal in shape and hairiness, that for a moment a wave of incredulity overtook her at the memory of the white, ringleted, blue-eyed tot who, not so many years before, had regularly caused strangers to coo over the buggy in parks and supermarkets. Both children had her scandy colouring. Lily, with the extra blessing of the fine-boned petiteness of Esther's mother, Astrid, but Dylan, as a baby, had definitely been the cutest. He had also been the more difficult, agonisingly reluctant to be born, taking 23 hours compared to Lily's two and a half. A child on a mission, the midwife had joked of her daughter. A similar resistance to the business of finding contentment had dominated Dylan's babyhood. Sleeping, feeding, being held, not being held, all the things a swaddled Lily had taken to with ease, her son had fought from the get-go like a raging mini sumo wrestler. The only thing guaranteed to make him chortle were the antics of his toddler sibling. Lily, predictably, had caught on to this power quickly, so often using the trick of springing out of hiding places shouting boo that it was the first word ever to blow from Dylan's lips, as well as the name he still used for her sometimes when they were horsing around. 
Esther had been engrossed by the sibling closeness that unfolded, the secret sign language, the sheer self-containment, the private hilarities. Only Lucas's insistence that Lily's atomic brain power warranted moving her to a different school had seen its easing. Left behind, Dylan's softer, more drifty nature had begun to emerge in earnest, manifesting itself in markedly poorer grades than his sister's and in dreamy insouciance. He was more like her, Esther would jokily and protectively point out, knowing what Lucas was thinking and not saying, with a good heart, but tendencies towards chaos and great intentions that didn't always come off. Esther softly closed Dylan's door, experiencing a faint shudder of a memory of the ambulance incident with which she had taunted Lucas. An accident and a one-off, Dylan had promised breezily, sitting up in the A&E cubicle bed afterwards, as if losing consciousness 45 minutes after swallowing a small white tablet gifted by a stranger at a party could happen to any 15-year-old. Luckily, the doctor on duty, a square-set rugby-playing sort and straight talker, had stepped in with a chilling catalogue of the range of potentially fatal reactions to MDMA. Hypertension, hypothermia, overheating, overhydration. Basically, you could die, mate, and that's the bottom line. Parked beside the bed, gripping one of Dylan's arms, just to be holding onto a piece of him, Esther had gratefully noted her son's eye blinks of shock, his thin, pallid face growing pastier as the list went on. She had glanced across at Lucas, standing a little apart, back against the white plastic curtain, in the hope of sharing the moment. But he had remained aloof in his anger, his eyes fixed only on their idiot son. Esther had experienced a rush of despair that there could be no pulling together in such a crisis had felt intolerable. How could she still be with a man who remained so closed against her when he chose? It was the opposite of what she had imagined. It could not go on. But even as the thought had formed, Lucas's eyes had travelled to hers, ablaze with all that she'd needed to see. Relief, affection, fatherly forgiveness, hope. There were reasons Lucas was as he was, Esther had reminded herself, as she always did. Reasons no one understood like her. The fight to love and be loved, that was every marriage. It just took different forms. How was Lily? Esther ventured now, gripping the flimsy banister pole as she went back down. It wobbled under her grasp, and for a moment the steps below her heaved. One slip and she would go headlong. An image flashed across her brain of her crumpled body on the landing, neck and limbs splayed awkwardly. Dylan having the grisly job of finding her, and on her birthday too of all days. Lily is in Rome. I know Lily is in Rome, Lucas, but you were seeing her before she went, weren't you? Oh, yes, she dropped by with Matteo. They both seemed fine. The usual somersault of envy flipped in her gut. It had made perfect sense for Lily to stay in Cambridge because of her studies, not to mention the blessing that was Matteo. But it also meant that Esther's hunger to see her daughter was never quite appeased. Lucas sensed that hunger, Esther was certain. Lily was like his trump card, and he played it ruthlessly. Many happy returns, by the way. Yeah, right. I hope you have something nice planned. Yep, lots thanks. Esther spoke tartly, silently thanking Shona for having come through with an offer of dinner, even though it turned out that Trixie Carroll fellow barrister and life partner for the last ten years wanted to come too. Apart from that, the highlight of her day was to be the usual lesson with Billy.
though at least there would be a smidge of Dylan now too, she reminded herself, thinking about silver linings. Arriving safely on the landing, she raised the phone to study her erstwhile husband properly. Lately, Lucas was big on being friends. The reason, as Esther well knew, was because someone called Heidi had been brought out of the shadows, a 33-year-old postdoc from Heidelberg University, an acquaintance of some six months, Lucas maintained, though Esther had her doubts. This intellectual and physical bombshell of a woman, googled by Esther many times, had met both children now. Oh yeah, Heidi's nice, they had both insisted, facial expressions snapping shut like clams. Heidi from Heidelberg. When Esther had told Viv, they had laughed hysterically and kept laughing, while inwardly Esther waged war with the illogical push-pull of not wanting something, but minding that someone else did. Lucas's luminous green eyes met hers steadily from the phone screen. They were intimidatingly alert, the skin around them still remarkably unlined for a 52-year-old. Esther searched for some glint of all the early, lovable self-doubt, despite knowing it was long gone. Lucas was an eminent professor now, his books of literary criticism were on university reading lists across the country. He was a frequent speaker at international academic conferences, Milan, Prague, Frankfurt. He was quite the jet setter. He even had his own YouTube channel where he posted his lectures and 2,000 followers on Twitter. He had been on the telly once, a guest on a history series, as well as on a couple of artsy radio programmes, talking engagingly about things like modern takes on courtly love and the feminist themes to be found in his beloved Gawain. Even his dark hair looked sure of itself these days, Esther marvelled, closely cropped and barely peppered, springing from its roots with all the ebullience that had been in evidence when they first met 25 years before. A birthday dinner of some kind, then? Lucas asked in his new jolly voice. Yes, Lucas, a birthday dinner of some kind, Esther conceded tightly, finding the conversation no easier for the fact that Lucas had once been good at birthdays, before broken nights and infants hollering for bottles and breakfast cramped his style. He would pretend to forget and then wake her with a bed tray of coffee, fresh berries Mounds of sunny scrambled eggs and a garden flower head lolling out of an egg cup. A parcel would be scrabbled for from under the bed, perfectly wrapped with inner layers of tissue paper and outer flourishes of trailing ribbon. Nestling inside would be something quirky or exquisite, a piece of porcelain, a first edition of poems by someone she hadn't heard of, a kimono. Most of these gifts had long since been bagged up and taken to charity shops. Viv had supported the wisdom of this, but also told Esther not to be afraid when memories surged. They had their own validity, she said, and should be allowed to play themselves out, though sometimes Esther thought a lobotomy would be more effective. How about you? All good with Heidi? she countered with a briskness designed to ram home the hateful impossibility of such pleasantries. Lucas was not, and never could be, a friend. He was the person with whom she had once shared not just merry birthday breakfasts, but moments, for Esther anyway, of sublime, unparalleled physical ecstasy. The person whose tears had merged with hers over the miracle of two newborns, whose hand she had grasped when, just pregnant with Lily and not knowing it, they had stood side by side at the graveside after his poor mother's suicide. The grasp had been holding Lucas upright, it felt like, while John, his father, swayed, dry-eyed and chisel-faced with drink across the grave. It was from that day that the full father-son estrangement had begun 
and Esther had shared the pain of that too, saying she understood even when Lucas's hardening refusal ever to refer to the situation, let alone explain it properly to their own children, had started to drive her mad. Yes, all good with Heidi, thank you, Esther, Lucas replied dryly. You should have kept track of him, Lucas, she burst out. It is your job for eight measly weeks to know where Dylan is. He's an official adult, and I knew exactly where he would be. You guessed. Correctly, as it turns out. Look, when he surfaces, tell him to call, would you? And say I shall expect him back this afternoon. No, you can tell him, using this invention called a phone, for which I am still paying because of your refusal to factor it into his allowance. And before you say it, no, Dylan is not lazy. He's desperate to earn some money. He told me he's been applying for bar work, don't start, Esther, for Christ's sake. I am not starting. And for the record, he swatted pretty hard for those bloody exams in the end. It would be great if you could at least tell him you know that. I might wait until the results in three weeks' time, if it's all the same to you. Esther moaned softly, stifling retorts as Lucas continued to expand on his theme. Exams, academic success, were how he judged everything. Taking him on about it was like wrestling concrete. She sought refuge instead in the view of her long, narrow, brambled garden through the landing window, where something was moving through the thickets, making them bounce. A fox, probably. But Esther thought instead of a predatory fish nosing its way through a thick green sea. And then of Chris Muse. Hunter or Suter? And was there even a difference? Despite the firmness of her farewell follow-up message after their date, he had texted several times now, saying absurd things like he missed her and wanted to try again. Esther had responded with silence. How could you miss someone you didn't know? Or have another go at something that hadn't started? There was an ugly wasteland beyond her fence the rail track running through its middle like a spine. The trains had kept her awake at first, but now she barely noticed them. And maybe that was the secret to contentment, Esther chided herself. Going with the flow, instead of trying always to take everything head on. Lucas had moved on to the happier subject of Lily's congregation, as he annoyingly liked to refer to the graduation ceremony, taking place on the Saturday immediately after Dylan's results. I've booked Wilson's for lunch. Weekends are busy, but they can squeeze us in outside. And I've made sure Dylan knows, so he's not gallivanting about somewhere celebrating. I assume I was right to include Patrick and Astrid? Yes, thanks. Mum and Dad have said they are planning to make a weekend of it. And we'll go halves on the bill, OK? OK? Esther bit her lip. This was perfectly fair. Apart from Lucas's pension, their divorce settlement had been 50-50. Lucas was the last person with whom she could share concerns about how the savings account she had set up after the settlement continued to shrink instead of grow, chiselling away at her dream of one day buying a garden flat, ideally with at least two bedrooms and a slightly less shabby street. With Matteo, that means you'll be seven in total. OK, I see. Good. No question of Heidi, then, thank God. Having got herself downstairs, Esther made a cup of tea and perched on her back doorstep, pulling her nightie over her knees. It was only eight o'clock, but a low canopy of grey cloud and a heaviness in the air suggested the start of another muggy day. Over the wonky boundary fence to her left, Carmela's clusters of electric yellow roses drooped like tired revellers, their petals blousy. On her other side, through the patched-up jigsaw of slats and wire, she could just make out Dimitri and Sue's sun lounges and a couple of scattered cans and bottles from the previous day's alfresco fun. 
her injured toe had swollen into a ghoulish, purple cocktail sausage, too sore to touch, let alone waggle. Proper shoes of any kind were going to be out of the question for a while, which meant flip-flops with whatever she decided to wear that evening. Shona, tall and naturally slim, would look glamorous because she always did, Esther reflected gloomily, happy to be diverted by her phone, buzzing into life with a string of birthday messages. Viv, her parents, Lily, even Rick had remembered from whatever highly paid job he was currently doing on Norwegian oil rigs. Many happies, gift on next visit, honest. Ah, kiss. Esther smiled to herself, long since accepting of how much better she and her brother were at liking each other from a distance. She opened Lily's last, releasing a little whoop at the sight of a link to a spa day gift for two in September. Girls together, happy birthday, Mum! Kiss, kiss. Date movable.